Is it your first time here at the IFFR? No, um, I was here uh, nine years ago with a film called Mark of Cain, which uh, won the Amnesty Award, the Movies That Matter Award that year. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a veteran of uh, Rotterdam, yeah. And is it because you made uh, documentaries and TV drama? And somebody once said to me that uh, with uh, fiction, with drama, you tend to uh, get closer to reality, actually, than with a documentary. You can... Uh, be more precise maybe than when you have to uh, focus on real life. What is your stance on that? Yeah, I think you could probably get, you, you can expose the internal that much better, I think. I mean, it's much more controllable. Uh, it's ironic that actually the main character in this piece is really opaque. So, you know, you never see the internal Paul, really. He's a, he's a mask of vanity and uh, narcissism most of the time. So it's ironic in this piece that you don't really get to the internal. But I think that's true with, with drama. You're able to, you know, you're able to write, you know, write those, those emotions, as it were, in a way that you might not get them in documentary. And you have received quite some uh, nominations for your uh, TV dramas, I read. What, uh, what makes a good one? Oh, God. Um, I mean, I just, uh, I, I think, first of all, you know, there's something about the zeitgeist, which, which, you know, people come to a piece. I mean, this has been very good because it's, even though it's a fictional piece, it's based on a lot of research that Jack Thorne did into various cases um, uh, which have been in the public arena, you know, widely publicised and written about. Um, and I think people came to it, and it was a big hit in the UK, and I think people came to it because they were interested in the notion of a celebrity being accused of a sex ab abuse um, crime. So I think zeitgeist is one of the things, and then I think just great writing and a, and a direction that elevates it slightly above the you know, above the writing, as it were, you know, and just brings out a, a sort of immediacy in it. I mean, I'm talking about television here because I think television works when it's very immediate. Yes, I think so, um, indeed. And is it because uh, I would think that maybe you can be response to uh, the uh, actuality faster with a TV series? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, it would be impossible to make a, f a film like a documentary of someone like this, you know, for all sorts of reasons, you know, n n not the least, the legal reasons. Um, I think when we when we were talking about making this piece the most famous cases in britain have been quite extreme like jimmy savile who was you know clearly predatory um uh and then you know at the other end of the spectrum people that have been accused and then acquitted found or, or accused and then there's not been enough evidence for them and what we were interested in exploring was that middle ground which existed 20 years or so ago where um, celebrity gave rise to a lot of abuse of power and I think it's that grey area that the, the programme deals with the history of that and the behaviour of people within that arena. And that is um, Operation U3, right, which uh, you're referring to in uh, the UK. And it was massive. Mm. I uh, read a few articles about it. What uh, were you f your first responses? Because you were uh, working as a, uh, in the media yeah. at the time as well. What is it to see this in your own business? Um, shocking. I mean, I think... Um, you know, the beauty of this piece, as it's written by Jack, is that the man is, um, is a national treasure. I mean, it's, he's someone who no one would believe such a thing, he could be capable of such a thing. And I think that's reflected in the, you know, in those real life cases. Those are very much like that. Um, and, you know, the piece deals with the fallout from that accusation, you know, and, and, and the disbelief amongst the press and amongst people that, that such a thing could happen. And at the end of the first episode, there was this um, call from Channel 4 to pe for people to uh, send their messages and their own experiences. I thought that was very strong and uh, uh, brave. What were the, were there a lot of responses? 
I don't know, actually. I can't, I, I'm, you know, I guess, I think they put up the number of a helpline. Uh, I don't know how many responses there were. I, I, I was, wasn't across yeah. that. Yeah. And was it, um, did you feel a lot of pressure for making this one? Because it was everywhere in the news. And um, I think there's a lot of pressure on telling the truth about um, those circumstances. I mean, obviously, we didn't have a responsibility to any individuals, but, you know, it is the fact that um, the successful prosecutions in rape cases is pitifully low. I mean, something like one in 60 uh, rape cases are successfully prosecuted. So I think that's the, those are the statistics. So, um, you know, you know and, 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 and of those rape cases, probably only a quarter of them are actually prosecuted in any way. So, so um, we had a responsibility, I suppose, to those people, that group of people. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the responsibility of the drama is to sort of excavate all those issues and make people think about it and, you know, and, and, and put, put that out in the public arena so people um, question their prejudices, I suppose. Yeah. And is it um, during, how long did the shooting of the series take? Uh, about 10 weeks. Everything? Yeah. For me, that it sounds very fast, but yeah, I don't know it, if is it is fast. fast. It's television. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> very Unfortunately. <sharp. laughs> Unfortunately, why? Because well, you one as a director, you'd love to have more time. You yes, know, of you'd course. always, you know, but you do an hour in twelve days. You know, and that's actually quite luxurious for television. You know, sometimes it can be less. Is than it that. because you made your first uh, series in the nineties? I think um, is what are the biggest differences between making it back then and now? Oh, I think it's probably less time and less money. Yeah. <laughs> Why is and that And there's always? more television. <laughs> yeah. You and know, maybe that maybe that's all related. You know. But it seems because people always tell that it's uh, more cinematographic and uh, there's more effort in it than it was maybe uh, twenty ten years ago. Now. No, I think I put just as much craft into it then as I do now. I think I, I just think um, I think uh, I don't know whether budgets have come down. I think they have. I think budgets are slowly coming down. Um, I think there's a lot more TV around. You know, there's a lot more um, people that show TV. Um, maybe there's you know maybe there's less money to go around. I don't know. And is it um, because when was it broadcasted in the UK, the series? September last year. September. And the Operation U Tree uh, was in, I forgot the date, when was it? Yeah, that's been going on for a few years. Yeah. Yeah, with various cases. And is it, how did the UK uh, deal with it? How does a society live after such revealings? Um. Well, I think that we're still living through it. I think there's probably still going to be cases unearthed. I mean, I'm all, you know, I'm surprised in some ways that there's been so few, you know, particularly in areas like the music industry. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that people are, you know, have lived through it. I think people are still coming to terms with it. Yeah, and it's, I'm sure it's not only in the UK, it's... Uh everywhere yeah well are there cases here there must be cases. there there have been uh, but it's a long time ago now again but with uh, 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 priests right right have but what about celebrities you celebrities know, like TV I don't and... really remember that no. well but I'm well yeah I, can't I, say I'm I, sure, I was in but... Germany um, day before yesterday doing a talk at a university and they had they named at least two or three people that, that you know were in the public eye that they've been you know cases of and and in France last week as well so so I think every you know every country will probably have its case I mean I think what's interesting is that I think people's behavior is you know one of the things about a program like this putting it out into the public arena is that it challenges people's behavior I think um, I think a, you know a lot of what happened 20 years ago or so was because no one talked about it and everyone there was a sort of conspiracy of silence. I think a lot of the time, 
um, that abuse of power. You know, that's, that this is basically what the, the program investigates, you know, what that power consists in and how people react to it. Um, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things about putting the program out there is that it, 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 it makes people aware of that sort of behaviour and, you know, perhaps it rectifies that in some sort of way. Yeah, because it's interesting to um, see, to figure out how power works, because it is something then when you become famous and have acquired this power that you, do you change immediately or does it go slowly step by step that you don't notice it yourself? How, how do you think that it works? I think probably a lot of those celebrities who committed those abuses didn't think they were, you know, didn't think that it was such an abuse. I, I, I think, um, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, one of the things about a program like this and the real life cases is that it, it calls people to account in some sort of way. You know, it challenges their behaviour and makes it, it makes them challenge, you know, um, question their own behaviour and things. Has it made you a different person um, in your career? Like the bigger projects you work on and uh, the bigger uh, responsibility you have? I don't know what you mean by that. You mean this program? Or? No, just um, because I can imagine when you start uh, your career and you uh, do one series after another and the budgets get bigger and bigger maybe yeah. and you work with more famous people that it maybe changes you as well, that you notice it with yourself, that you are now a different person than maybe when oh, okay. you were beginning. Well, I've, I'm not a celebrity. I mean, I, I, you know, and also my budgets have not got bigger and bigger. I, <laughs> you know, I tend to do stuff which is, I totally follow, um, you know, the work, as it were. So I might end up doing something quite small. And I mean, this is a really low budget piece, um, you know, National Treasure. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that, I mean, I suppose one gets more experience, you know. I'm definitely aware of the abuse of power as a director completely, yeah. I mean, I think that can be very, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, the power that you have as a director on set, it, you know, can be quite heady. And, um, you know, if you, if, if you give over to it in some sort of way, and I'm, I'm definitely uh, aware of that and very... Um, uh, policing of myself in that respect you know I'm, I'm, I'm you know for me it's all about the work anyway but I do think that similarly to the time when Paul Finchley committed these abuses you know similarly film directors were also badly behaved as well and I think you know I, th I think that you know because I grew I, I, I sort of grew up as a runner you know an assistant for uh, for filmmakers and things and I think that behavior is that abuse of power and I'm not talking about rape necessarily but I'm talking about the abuse of power has changed a lot over the years you know and that can only be a good thing and I but think. maybe that is the key what you, you just said that you are uh, focused only on the work maybe that's yeah. a big difference if you stay focused on the work and that is your priority then you don't uh, well, then power doesn't matter to you in another way than just for your work. Yeah, I think, I, I, you know, my philosophy is getting the best out of people around me, you know, and I'm quite ruthless in that respect, you know, but I don't think that's an abuse of power. I just, you know, I, people get tired and people get exasperated and people probably hate my guts. But actually, I think, you know, for me, it's not about, it's not about, you know, the abuse of power, it's about getting the best out of people in some sort of way, you know, and whether that's the actors or whether it's the cinematographer or the editor or whatever. You know. And um, what was in the, um, in the part in the series, uh, what it, because you just said that uh, your main character, the main actor, Robbie uh, Coltrane, did I yeah. pronounce well? Okay. That he added a lot as well to the character. Yeah. What was the collaboration between the two of you? Um, he's a man who is incredibly generous, um, incredibly outward looking. Um, he's interested in lots and lots of things and he's interested in people, you know. So he'll talk to, you know, he'll be as engaged with the runner as he will be with whoever, you know. Um, and this is sort of, gr there's a great sort of uh, amount of wisdom and learning and generosity there. And, but also he's very funny as well. I mean, he, he is very funny. And I think 
there's lots of character traits that he brought to the character which, 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 uh, of Paul Finchley, which made the character live, I think. You know, like the little funny voices, the theatricality of it, um, uh, all those sort of things, the way he carried himself and interacted with other people. There's a lot of Robbie in that, and that's what made it special, I think. Yeah, I think so. Of, of course, because he is the main character, but also you see so much in him, so you... Uh... Yeah, I mean the piece is about really, um, you're looking at a man who is, you're wondering whether he's guilty or innocent, but he has an opaqueness about him, he, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna learn that from him. I always thought the interesting thing about the piece was that, that um, and by the time you get to the end, you do discover whether he's innocent or guilty of these crimes, um, but it's only one factor that you're interested in by that time. What you've learned and what you're interested in is the way that he treats his family and the fallout from that accusation on the rest of the family, on his daughter and on his wife. I mean, in that sense, it's an ensemble piece. Um, but um, it's only one factor. And I think that, um, you know, your... your, your um, I always thought that the, the, the one of the most interesting things about it was that you'd bring your judgment to bear on this piece based on the way that he treated other people rather than whether he did the crime or not. Because it's not a forensic piece, it's not a procedural piece or a forensic piece. So you're making these judgments all the time without knowing whether he's guilty or innocent and without being given a lot of evidence. Um, but you're making a judgment based on the way that he, he, he treats other people. Yeah, and it's fascinating because as a viewer you think it's almost as if he doesn't know it. That you... And I only saw episode one, so yeah. I'm very curious where it uh, will head. And you... Well, the piece is about doubt. I mean, that's the main subject of the piece. So, um, uh, uh, it, you know, he... he you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, self-deception in that character as well, and um, a lot of vanity. And uh, you know, the audience are um, are engaged in this sort of doubt with that main character. You know, that's the central thrust of the piece. So, when can I watch the next here in Holland? Uh, in April. In April at yeah. the NPO. NPO. Yeah. Very well pronounced. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for your time and have fun at Pleasure. the festival. Pleasure.